Thank you very much for the introduction, and also thank you very much for the invitation for this opportunity. Uh, since uh, Professor Kashiwara's uh, birthday was earlier this uh, year, I cannot say happy birthday today, but I'd like to uh, offer you a happy birth year and 70th. <laughs> So a quantum curve <coughs> is, uh, still we don't have a good uh, definition yet. So a quantum curve is something like uh, it's something like a family of, um, of uh, Reese uh, D modules. on a curve C, um, so that uh, we can construct uh, the semi-classical limit. So the notion of semi-classical limit exists on this. And this uh, semi-classical limit produces a family of spectral curves in the cotangent bundle of C. So uh, this is a kind of uh, a definition because uh, we don't really capture everything in this uh, format. So uh, um, I'd like to give a talk uh, in the two parts. One is a motivational part, namely it is related to the uh, enumeration of uh, interesting uh, numbers. Then um, um, that is exactly where the physics uh, motivation comes in. So physicists uh, Ganagic, uh, Digraf, Krem, uh, Marino, and Waffa wrote a paper around 15 years ago, where or maybe published around 10 years ago, where they introduced these quantum curves to uh, capture <coughs> some com um, quan quantum topological invariance of um, some manifold. <coughs> then uh, later, Gukov, Sukovsky, and then many other people are uh, using this uh, quantum curve technique to understand the not invariance. So that's uh, one part of the motivation in physics. Yet uh, those uh, motivation uh, understanding themselves is hard. So let me just start with a uh, mathematical motivation. And then later um, I'd like to relate this um, motivational consideration to uh, another uh, physics conjecture made by uh, Davide Gaiotto in a, a geometric setting. So that is what I'd like to talk about today. So um, um, mathematical motivation comes from uh, Hurwitz numbers. <coughs> so these are uh, purely uh, classical objects studied uh, by Hurwitz in 1891 and so on. So uh, the definition is that you consider a meromorphic function of a Riemann surface of genus G. So let's assume this is a compact Riemann surface of genus G to a projective line. And then um, a bunch of conditions you impose so that the enumeration becomes non-trivial. So uh, first, um, F has a labeled poles of orders, say mu1 up to mu uh, n, so the number of poles is n, they are all labeled, and these are uh, positive integers. And then a df equal to zero has, so this is the uh, critical points, uh, set of critical points except for the poles, has um, uh, only simple uh, zeros. And then uh, one more condition, because uh, if you impose only these, uh, the space of all meromorphic functions uh, is a finite dimensional manifold. So to make it a zero dimension, we want to say that uh, uh, the image of this uh, critical uh, points, namely critical values, which are actually branch point um, in P1 are fixed. So then uh, uh, this uh, quantity would become finite. Uh, number and then, uh, well, of course, you have to divide by the automorphism and so on, but uh, that's a finite number, a rational number. I'd like to denote this by Hurwitz number of this uh, notation. Then, uh, just uh, 
uh, using this uh, representation theoretic uh, realization of this uh, quantity, there's a, a combinatorial um, equation Well, actually, this equation doesn't play any role in my talk, so I, there's no reason to write it up. But since I love formulas, every talk has to have uh, one single formula, at least. So let me just write down the formula. So uh, first, uh, the number of branched points, so, so each branch point except for infinity are simple. So R is a number of uh, simple ramification points. So this is just a uh, solution of a number of solutions of df, df is, is equal to zero, which is actually um, uh, sim uh, easy to compute by Riemann Hurwitz. So it's a 2g minus 2 plus the n is the number of poles plus a sum of all mu's, which is the degree. So this is just a sum of all mu's. So um, combinatorial equation is that uh, if you multiply r to um, hgn and then mu as a vector, uh, breaks down in several pieces. So this is equal to first um, half summation i is not equal to j. And then, uh, so what uh, I'm doing is that uh, when you realize this as a representation of pi 1 of punctured p1, um, r point you have transposition you assign. And then over the infinity, you have a cycle type uh, mu1 up to mu n, an um, element of the cyclic group. And then you count how many are there. And that is this number. So what I'm doing is that one of these uh, transpositions, I bring it to the infinity and then merge them together. Then two things happen. So this is what uh, <coughs> this is writing. So I plus ij. So um, um, two cycles uh, in the infinity are uh, uh, put, in, put together and then I remove two uh, cycles. So cycle length is less, one less, and then half. Uh, summation i runs from 1 to n. And then uh, I break a uh, now single cycle into two pieces with a um, merging of the um, <coughs> transposition. So this would cause uh, the summation like this. Then uh, alpha times beta, and then uh, uh, two pieces again. So hg minus 1, n plus 1, alpha, beta, and then a, a mu. Now mu i is broken into two pieces. So everything, so if I don't mention anything, everything else stays. And then uh, uh, set partition and then number partition. So genus g, so in this case, uh, you are cutting the um, handle of this uh, image curve, I mean, uh, source curve. And then in this case, cutting the um, neck of the source curve so that uh, it will become <laughs> disconnected. And then, um, so in this case, h, g1. So notation probably is self-explanatory, so I don't go too much into this. g2, and then j plus 1, and the beta uh, mu j. So uh, this is um, not a traditional way of writing the equation. An equation can be uh, called in many different ways. Um, uh, it is first, a similar expression was discovered by Gordon Jackson. So I just uh, use uh, then a terminology cut and join equation. <coughs> so this, this is the uh, formula. Now, uh, so the number is uh, to be normalized in a certain way, like like that the mass divided by the automorphism group. When you define the Hurwitz number, you have to to take into account the automorphism. Right, right. So this is autom uh, automorphism normalized. Yes, already. So they are uh, not integers; they are just uh, rational numbers. Right. And then uh, with this uh, normalization, this formula holds. Right. So this is the equation for the rational numbers here. So uh, the theorem, so uh, maybe let me just erase this part. And g1 and g2 are, are, are less than g or, or could, could allow? Sorry, uh, g? g1 and g2 are, are what could be zero. Yeah, it can be zero. So this is all possible uh, partitions. And the all possible uh, set partitions, including the um, empty set. So um, g has to be greater than or equal to 0. n has to be uh, greater than or equal to 
one, these are the only condi conditions. It's okay. So this is about what I said, uh, equation. I'm not talking about the kind of formula. So G and N appear also here. So it doesn't allow you to calculate, to reduce to. But of course, the, uh, a mu, the size of mu is reduced on the right hand side. So from the computational point of view, uh, hand calculation doesn't work. <coughs> Only computer program works because you can reduce the size of mu in this way. But that's not my point. The point is the next sta stage. So uh, let me just uh, phrase the theorem. Um, actually published in three different uh, uh, papers with uh, uh, Nigel Jiang, and then uh, also with uh, uh, Beltrand uh, Enach, and then uh, Brad Safnuk, and then um, also, uh, maybe just uh, make a petition here, uh, also um, uh, Piotr Sukowski. Says the following number one, uh, you introduce the Laplace transform of this number. So uh, define fgn as a holomorphic function, so n holomorphic uh, co complex uh, variables, uh, to be just a Laplace transform. So mu is uh, just an integer vector of size n, and then uh, hgn uh, of mu. Then uh, I just uh, multiply islands from 1 to n of xi to the power mu i. Well, I said the um, Laplace transform, which means that uh, I'm thinking x variable is simply e to the minus w. Uh, I don't use this uh, co coordinate, so I just suppress. But uh, this is a uh, um, discrete Laplace transform. Then several things happen. Then uh, Laplace transform of this equation, cut and join equation, um, is a PDE recursion or induction formula with respect to the quantity 2g minus 2 plus n. So uh, the question was that uh, this doesn't allow you to compute a function hgn as a function of uh, integer variable uh, mu. <coughs> but uh, here, if you do the Laplace transform, then you can in actually it changed the Laplace transform of this equation, which is a PDE, but the PDE becomes a genuine recursion with respect to 2g minus 2 plus n. I'm not going to write the formula. This is just a little bit too complicated, but uh, nature is exactly the same. And then in this formula, you do not allow the same g and then appears. So that the formula becomes indeed a, a PDE recursion. So this one is uh, indeed a, a originally conjectured by Marcos Marinho. So it is a Laplace transformation of what? Uh, I understand the point. What are the x1, x2, xn? What are the space where this, this acts? Ah, so uh, you, yes, uh, it's a good question because um, uh, uh, the question is, uh, does this converge? And then uh, what kind of uh, space are you talking about? Yes, you are looking at Indeed, the simple examples, uh, this is um, um, not the formal power series, actually. It is a convergent power series. And then uh, i get back to your, uh, the question to your answer later, a little later. At this moment, we are simply looking at that as a power series. Yes, there is a radius of convergence, which is non-zero. Right. So at this moment, just the x are complex parameters. Okay. So, um, it's a generating function, <laughs> of course. <laughs> People don't call it Laplace transform. <laughs> but uh, the reason why I want to say Laplace transform is that uh, if you have an equation, generating series, yeah, but the Laplace transform ca can transform the equation itself to an equation. Right. So that's what I meant. So Marino and then his group. Uh, so, that, uh, uh, so, so this is a recursion, uh, existence of recursion was uh, con conjectured by him. And then a um, uh, second thing is that uh, yeah, so this is the, uh, uh, after long calculations, you realize that uh, let's introduce a new variable t, which is again related to your question. So, so t actually um, is indeed a 
parameter over projective line. So indeed, uh, where it is uh, defined is uh, uh, end product of P1. That is the answer to your question. So let's introduce a new variable T in this uh, mechanism. So let's let T be as above. Then, so I can just uh, plug all these uh, um, variables, x of t1 dot 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 x of tn. So let me just abbreviate uh, later, these are just t's. Um, then is a, sorry, is a polynomial uh, in t of degree 6g minus 6 plus 3n. So, so to me, that, that was a very surprising thing. And then um, Marino did not conjecture this part either. So this is <laughs> somehow what happens to be. So it is a polynomial in T. And then uh, this polynomial, uh, when you write down the formula, it's obvious in some sense. So this is uh, alpha 1 plus alpha n. All these are uh, non-negative integers, uh, less than 3g minus 3 plus n. And then uh, uh, this is actually a tensor polynomial. So each variable has one polynomial here. I runs from 1 to n. And then a d alpha i applied to c0 of ti. So I have to, and then I'll have to fill in this <laughs> uh, rational coefficient. So here, uh, d is a differential operator, d dx. In terms of t I'm using, because I'm applying it to t, so this is t, t, t squared t minus 1 ddt is a differential operator. Yeah, actually, uh, Zagier told me that he knew this kind of thing sev uh, 17 years ago and so on. Uh, C0 of t is actually d squared applied to f01t. So this is a generating function of the uh, Hurwitz numbers of the simplest situation, namely um, the rational curve covering rational curves with only one pole. So that number you can easily calculate, so you can determine this function easily. You apply this, and then uh, you realize that uh, this function is actually t minus 1. So this is the uh, degree 2 alpha i plus 1 polynomial, and you uh, uh, just uh, multiply them together. Then um, here, the rational number is an intersection number. So tau alpha 1, tau alpha n times capital omega g n. And then this is the uh, intersection over the moduli space MGN bar. So here, uh, omega GN in general is uh, what uh, uh, Maxim and the Manning called cohomological field theory. So uh, usually you have to choose um, um, <coughs> Frobenius algebra A, and then uh, this N tensor uh, represents this number N here, going to the cohomology ring of MGN bar, the stable curves of rational coefficients. But uh, in our case, I don't have to really explain what it is, because in our case, A is simply one-dimensional <laughs> vector space. So this is a trivial Frobenius algebra uh, field itself. And then uh, how it is defined. So in our case, this is indeed, uh, so uh, since it's one dimension, just the value is important. This is actually a total churn polynomial of what is called the Hodge bundle which actually doesn't depend on n, at t is equal to minus 1, where uh, you do have to introduce this uh, projection, um, which, uh, well, maybe let me just write in this way. The, uh, well, that doesn't matter. I set it to minus 1. But of course, this t and uh, that t are <laughs> different things. Uh, yeah, give me some letter, please. <laughs> Whatever. So mgn plus 1 goes down to mgn. And uh, so this is the projection, um, which actually forgets the last marked point. Here, uh, since this is a universal curve, you do have a relative canonical uh, line bundle. So this is what I write. Maybe a plus one is a little easier to understand, but it's, it's OK. So this is just a cotangent bundle along the fiber. And then uh, you push it down. That is EGN, which is just a push forward GN star of this uh, canonical. So this is a rank uh, G bundle. Uh, the, the differential forms behave uh, very well in the degeneration of curves 
on this uh, dream manifold compactification. So this is not really only the um, not only the coherent sheaf, it is actually vector bundle, rank never changes anywhere how you degenerate, because the degeneration is uh, restricted here. So this is a vector bundle, and then you compute its total char class, uh, and then uh, take uh, t equal to minus one. Then this is a conservative man in cohomological field theory, which shows up here, and then this polynomial is equal to that polynomial after substitution. So this is a part of the theorem we proved. <coughs> So you work on the modular stack of curves? This is the modular stack of curves, yes. Okay, so you have to, 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 and do you have to work only in the range where usually, because sometimes there are many automorphisms of... Yeah, yeah, uh, stable curves, yes, it's a modular of stable curves. So, so it's an orbifold. Okay. So you need the G is larger, because for G equals zero and one, Oh, thank you. I completely forgot to mention. Uh, yes, if 2g minus 2 plus n is greater than 0. Thank you. <laughs> and then uh, indeed, uh, f01 and f02 are not polynomials. Of course, from this uh, uh, formula, it's obvious. After application of this differential operator, it is a polynomial. So it cannot be a polynomial. So only after uh, C0, it becomes polynomial. And then uh, these are the co uh, uh, coordinates uh, uh, Maxim and Jan are using in your formulation. What is tau alpha? Tau alpha. Um, okay, so um, there is a canonical section from here to here. Um, so uh, the, the data here is a curve with uh, n marked points and then a fiber is a universal curve itself. So the curve itself is on the fiber, which in particular has a marked point. So you can put this data to that point on the fiber that is a, a um, section in here. Then you pull back this uh, relative canonical bundle. By this section, you get the line bundle here. And then the first term class, of this line bundle to the power alpha one is tau alpha one, and so on. So there are n different line bundles by this uh, section, and then pull back, take a power. So this is the uh, Witten's notation um, in the uh, physics language. It is uh, um, correlation function. So this uh, bracket is, of course, integration over this MGN bar, right, of these uh, cohomology classes. Okay, so um, uh, this is just um, part of that theorem. I, I see. Sh how strong should I push? Okay, is it okay? There is a hook over there. Hook, I, I thought it's a pull down, but you can also <laughs> push up. Can we push? You will have problems. Yeah. You can use this. So pull back and push down. Both can be done. <laughs> <laughs> Which one is a vector bundle? <laughs> okay, so uh, um, now let's define. Sorry, um, do I want to say anything else here? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, so just define C of x and h bar. Now x is the original x, not the t variable, uh, is equal to just the exponential of gigantic summation. All g, all n. And then one over n factorial because I symmetrize everything. And then h bar 2g minus 2 plus n, not h, so n, of fgn. So here I do allow unstable regions, g equal to 0, n equal to 1 and 2. And then I put all x to be the same. So let's uh, define this as a wave function. So uh, if you don't set, so this is indeed the principal specialization of a symmetric function. If you don't symmetrize, then the exact same expression with infinitely many variables is a kp tau function. So that has been known to a Russian school uh, 20 years ago. But uh, now I'm uh, using this uh, principal specialization and then uh, find a simple expression. Then this solves the following ordinary differential equation, which is h bar x ddx minus 
x times e to the power h bar, uh, sorry, x d dx. I said the differential equation, it is actually dif differential difference equation. Psi x h bar is equal to zero. So what I'd like to talk about, I mean, uh, say is that uh, this is an example of a quantum curve. It is a vial quantization of some sort of algebraic or analytic curve here. So this psi is a solution. So this uh, is uh, indeed uh, rather simple to prove in this particular case. And then, uh, so what I mentioned is that the uh, knot theory people are doing is that uh, here you bring a colored Jones polynomial, you have a, a difference operator that kills, and then this difference operator is a quantization of the A polynomial. Things like that have been speculated. Uh, it's never been proved in those cases. So here, semi-classical limit. Here, what is h bar? I'm going to give you the definition of h bar later in geometry. Okay, so here h bar is a parameter. Is it real or complex? Uh, complex. And then here, yeah, important point is that uh, this expression never converges with respect to h bar. Uh, and then also it is uh, really strange because if g equal to zero and equal to one, h power is minus one. And then the rest is positive and then I'm still taking exponential. So how do you define this kind of mixture of exponential of negative powers and positive powers? So it's all a legitimate question. At this moment, it's a formal expression and I'll make sense immediately out of it, okay? So at this moment, it's, uh, uh, h bar is a um, parameter where it is not expected for any convergence anyway later. It's a WKB expansion. So um, here, semi-classical limit makes sense. So how you do that? Uh, the question was, uh, uh, this one starts with a negative power of h bar and it goes to zero positive and so on. So how you make sense? Well, I separate out the negative power from here. It's exponential, so it's a multiplication. And then uh, uh, sandwich with a, a negative power there. So what I want to do is to compute negative one over h bar. F01 is the uh, uh, h bar inverse proportional term. And then uh, I do the same operation. You may wonder why I kept x, because x you can cancel out. But uh, it, x times a ddx is an important quantity. So I just uh, kept it in that way, so f01. So f01 is a function in x, and I d make this uh, conjugation and then compute. So if you do that, um, so after that, you can take limit h bar goes to 0. So the honest computation, so this is exactly what uh, uh, we learn in the quantum mechanics uh, first year course, then the result is that, uh, so this change into y, and then this change into e to the y is equal to zero. Where y is definitely here, is a d applied to f01. So d is a x d d x. So this is what uh, uh, happens. And then uh, this is the uh, uh, curve. Now this one can be solved. Uh, x is equal to y e to the minus y, so this is equal to that, and then that has a name, it's, a, it's called the Lambert function. And then this appears in the tree counting problem anyway. So semi-classical limit is indeed the Lambert function, which is essentially the generating function of zero one invariant. That's what uh, it, it is happening. So these are the uh, theorems uh, we found. Then, um, so this is an example. So, so this curve, uh, we call it the spectral curve. And then uh, the deformation we'd like to consider here. So I said that the family of uh, some sort of D modules. So we'd like to consider the family of this kind of object. So here, uh, the uh, uh, deformation we want to do is the following. So um, we just uh, make a limit lambda goes to zero of uh, uh, lambda to the power 6g minus 6 plus 3n, and then fgn. And then inside, you just uh, scale everything with this uh, parameter lambda. And then, uh, so this one, let me call it fgn tilde, which is just a function in original variables. Now this is the homogeneous polynomial because, because I pick, picked up only the uh, top degree terms and everything else is killed. So it's a homogeneous polynomial of uh, degree 6g minus 6 plus n, which is indeed 
having a simple expression. The sum of all alphas are equal to now 3g minus 3 plus n. And then uh, intersection numbers are exactly what uh, Maxime considered many years ago. And then uh, so uh, it's a tensor product i runs from 1 to n. Uh, d tilde alpha i c0 ti tilde. And then here, um, what I'm doing here is a t very large asymptotics. Which means uh, the operator d changed to t tilde as t is large. So this looks like simply t cube d dt. And then a c tilde 0. So t minus 1 doesn't count. So it is equal to t. So you plug it in here, then uh, you do get uh, the uh, generating function of intersection numbers, exactly what Maxim considered uh, many years ago. And then uh, uh, wh what I mentioned here is that the Laplace transform of cut and join equation can be restricted to t large. And then this is indeed a Vila solo constant condition. So uh, this gives the simple pr simplest proof of the uh, famous theorem of Maxim's, but of course done many years after the discovery of the theorem itself. So all what uh, this uh, Virasoro comes from is this uh, uh, combinatorial formula where you merge transposition into the general type um, cycle <coughs> or uh, permutation. So that's all what uh, was behind the scene. It uh, was our understanding of this thing. So um, this gives the motivation. One thing I'd like to say is that uh, what did I do here? So in this limit process, what happened is that uh, this uh, uh, original omega gn actually changed into uh, little omega gn, where um, it is uh, indeed, if there were Frobenius algebra, then I'm making this to uh, H0 part of mg n bar q. So I'm picking up not a cohomology ring, but uh, just a zero d uh, dimensional, zero degree cohomology. So this uh, gadget is called two dimensional TQFT. So from the cohomological field theory, uh, degenerate into the degree zero part gives you this. Um, computation, allows you to make this computation. So that is uh, the process I'd like to consider in. What, what is T and what is TI? I, I didn't understand this part. But TI and T are the same? TI and? Zero of TI and this T goes to infinity asymptote. Ah, uh, sorry. Yeah, I can say, uh, well, yeah. Um, TI, is it better? Then it needs some. What is the operator then? D, 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 yeah. Right. So um, I apply the operator to the function in T, where T is replaced by T i. Yeah. Okay. So um, each operator you can put T sub i. Right. It's a tensor product. So you do the same operation, and then uh, um, name these uh, variables in a different way. Right. OK, so uh, uh, let me just uh, uh, hurry up. And then, uh, so this is uh, the motivational part. And then the relation between this curve, or the Lambert function over there, and the differential operator, that is the uh, quantization we'd like to study. So geometry. So this uh, actually uh, comes from uh, one, of the, uh, one conjecture that Gaiotto made. So since uh, most of the things are defined already by uh, Philip earlier this morning, so I just uh, rely on that. And then uh, now change the gear completely, so it doesn't reflect any Hurwitz situation. Now it is a, a Gaiotto situation. So C is an um, Riemann, compact Riemann surface. It's not really algebraic curve structure I need. I need really analytic structure. So compact Riemann surface and then genus is, uh, uh, for the moment, uh, greater than 2. Well, uh, we will generalize it later. <coughs> then uh, what uh, already, um, so let me use uh, notation G for the complex, uh, simple, um, um, simply connected 
again, a complex Lie group. But uh, for the presentation uh, with respect to time, let me just restrict to the case S, L, and C. Then um, already it was introduced the Dolbo moduli space. So this is a moduli space of uh, Higgs uh, bundles. And then it's important that they are stable ones. So I, I'm not considering the moduli stuck here the stable ones, because I want to change into analysis. So Higgs bundles, where E is a vector bundle and the phi is just a <coughs> So K is a canonical again. So this is the uh, all linear, all module uh, uh, homomorphism here is a Higgs bundle. The stability simply means that if you have any uh, holomorphic vector bundle, um, uh, which goes, uh, the vector bundle f goes to f tensor k, then that vector bundle has to have degree purely negative. That's the stability condition. And then um, uh, he also mentioned uh, DRAM moduli space, M uh, DRAM. So this is the moduli space of flat connections. So here, uh, I forgot to say, since I'm talking about SLN, so determinant of E is uh, fixed as a, a structure shift. So here, this is the uh, holomorphic connection. Since it, uh, it's everywhere holomorphic, the uh, degree of uh, the vector bundle has to be zero. And then uh, I also Im impose the condition stability is irreducible. Irreducible means that the monodromy, uh, holonomy representation um, goes to the uh, um, Zariski open uh, part of the structure group. So uh, then I'd like to say the following. So um, non-Labidian Hodge correspondence that uh, uh, Phil was talking about, Philip was talking about this morning, was an, a diffeomorphism from Dolbo to uh, Drum. And then how it goes is the following. So you consider the data, holomorphic data, from the uh, Dolbo moduli space. So it's a holomorphic object. Then um, this the stability condition is the system of partial differential equations that has been uh, studied in the 80s by Dons and Yao, Urenbeck, those people. So if you do the same thing here, the stability condition becomes the following. So you first look at the topological part of the vector bundle since the determinant is trivial. This is actually topologically trivial bundle. So you introduce Hamitian uh, fiber metric H and then with respect to Hamishan fiber metric H, uh, the complex structure E is encoded into the um, Chan connection D. And then uh, you uh, have this uh, holomorphic phi. So you just uh, uh, here, I'm sorry, I'm uh, mixing two things together. So uh, here, uh, Chan connection D, and then the phi is itself here, which satisfies the following nonlinear equation. The curvature plus phi and then phi Hamishan conjugate with respect to h is equal to zero and then the phi is uh, indeed holomorphic. So this is the uh, system of equations called Hitchin equations. And then uh, this one is indeed uh, the flatness of the following. So d zeta, this is called the twister line. So this is a Chan connection, which is a unitary connection, plus one over zeta phi plus zeta phi dagger is flat for all zeta inside the C cross. So that is the uh, um, way of encoding the algebraic definition of stability into the differential geometric um, condition of a PDE. So that is uh, what uh, is known. So this, and then um, from here, what you do is a solution to, uh, um, so, well, maybe this uh, solution uh, HD phi with a, a flat d of zeta. So that is the uh, equivalent information. And then from here, what you want to do is that uh, first you look at the zeta equal to one. So zeta equal to zero picks up the information of phi. Phi is a holomorphic one. So zeta equal to zero goes back to the original because Chan connection encodes the complex structure of E. 
And then uh, now zeta equal to 1, what I'd like to do is that uh, um, 0, 1 part um, on the topologically trivial bundle uh, gives you a new complex structure. And then uh, since I define the uh, holomorphic structure by 0, 1 part, uh, the uh, 1, 0 part is automatically holomorphic. So th that is the uh, uh, point on the um, Dolbo moduli. I'm sorry, Duran moduli. And then this is indeed uh, the uh, isomor uh, diffeomorphism is approved by uh, the small run cases, Donaldson and Hitchin, and then uh, Simpson and then Colette did uh, all the general situations of a higher dimensional base. So this is what uh, uh, non abelian Hodge correspondence is. Then uh, what uh, David Gaiotto said is that uh, let's look at the following family. You introduce um, real parameter. Well, it doesn't have to be positive, but let me, let me just take positive. Real parameter, and then define this as the same Chan connection plus R over zeta phi plus uh, R times the zeta phi gamma. So R appears not in the same way as zeta, just uh, R is a re-squaring of phi. And then a uh, Hamishan conjugation doesn't uh, oh, change R at all. So, so this is a definition. And then uh, uh, Gaiotto said that the limit, the scaling limit, zeta goes to zero, R goes to zero, and then this uh, ratio is fixed. So the question, what was h bar? <laughs> yeah, you fix the ratio to be a complex number, and then uh, this look at uh, this quantity exists. So he said that this exists and is an OPA. So to be precise, this is a h bar uh, parameterized family of OPAs. What is an OPA? So OPA is an, a particular point on the um, drum moduli space. So uh, E nabla, so which is a connection, is an OPA. Uh, means that uh, there is, so three conditions, there is a filtration, zero is equal to Fn, goes to Fn minus one, sorry, it's not the uh, uh, exact sequence. F1, F0 is equal to E, and then two, um, brief is transversality, so the connection restricted to each piece, Fi, goes to Fi minus one tensor Kc, and then the third condition is a real dimension cutting condition so that uh, uh, it generates the grading, gradation, so f my, uh, which is which, plus one goes to f i minus one over f i tensor k c is a OC linear isomorphism. So when you have a, a filtered vector bundle with a connection satisfying this, it is called an OPA. So that's what uh, um, Gaiotto said, and then uh, this one should be an OPA. And then, um, so this, uh, so what I really would like to do is try to relate this with this, um, with the uh, uh, condition. But of course, uh, here, uh, his uh, conjecture, so, the, uh, so this is just a the definition of the procedure. Uh, the actual conjecture is that uh, if you choose E nabla, um, sorry, e, not nabla. Uh, let me just uh, write more precisely. E zero phi q uh, is on the Hitchin section. Then this uh, limit, the double scaling limit, scaling limit, is an OPA. So it is never true for, for uh, arbitrary E and uh, phi. Yes? Yeah. Uh, so if, if you suppose fix the R and then take the residue of the D zeta R, then, then uh, you, you will, means, uh, it, it is not evident that H bar is fixed then. Means suppose for a moment to fix the R, then take the residue at zeta equal to zero of this, uh, this D, D combinant D of zeta R then you will find that R is the residue. That's, uh, so I don't understand why H bar would be fixed then. Uh, it would be... 
Well, this is a particular limit I'm talking about. I want both uh, zeta and r go to zero simultaneously. Yeah. Oh, no, just have some fundamental understanding. If you have Hitchin equations, it's for r not equal to one, it's not a flat connection. So uh, I have to change the Hitchin equation here. Uh, the, where did I write? Here, r square comes in here. Right, right. So uh, this equation is modified, and this one isn't. Yes. So the fundamental, we are solving that equation. And then therefore, uh, r goes to 0 would, uh, would actually force the metric to explode. Ah, so it means that you just rescale the uh, Higgs field and that's the what, what the corresponding flat connection. That's right. And then uh, so uh, what happens is that maybe j this is what uh, I want to say in the end, but I may not have time. So uh, you look at this uh, dull drum moduli. Hitchin section, I'm going to explain in a minute. Would the go to, by non abelian Hodge, the real slice of the drum moduli, SL and R uh, connections. But then uh, as soon as you change the complex structure from the original a minute later, it will be all the same as the drum complex structure. So it is hyperkeda. So there is a P1 a parameter family of complex structures, but everything else is the same as here, except for this one. So um, you just change it and then uh, bring it back, zeta goes to zero, as close as original, rescale it, then it becomes tangent to the open moduli. So that's what is happening. So, so this happens to group by h bar, right? Huh? I mean, h bar is anything here. So h bar is anything. h bar gives you actually the opa as a Drin connection. h bar is equal to lambda of the Drin's connection. So it's a family of h, uh, lambda connections. Sorry, what is, what is lambda in terms of h bar? Huh? Yeah, yeah. So, so I have to. I want to say a lot of things here. So let me just say uh, first I have to define Hitchin section, okay? And then uh, yeah, come back to your point. So Hitchin section, um, yes, Hitchin section here. I do have to use the constants principal TDS. So for the quantization, so we, we call this a procedure quantization completely analogous to the Hurwitz and so on, has to depend on the hidden existence of SL2. So SL2 is indeed uh, essential for the quantization here. So constant uh, principal TDS, uh, I don't have the time to define, but uh, constant was uh, intrigued by the Poincaré polynomial of a, a simple, simply connected Lie group. And then uh, he wanted to uh, explain the exponent of that factor and in terms of a representation theoretic way and then discover. So this is the, for any such Lie group or Lie uh, algebra of that group, there exists up to conjugation a unique uh, three-dimensional TDS uh, satisfying such a such condition. For SLK uh, N case, it's obvious because the, uh, there's a unique N-dimensional representation of SL2. Uh, any question over there? Oh, what is TDS? Three-dimensional simple subalgebra. SL2. <laughs> Principal SL2. So every, uh, sim I mean, a simple Lie algebra has a. I see. <laughs> well, sorry, uh, I'm just uh, copying from Costan's paper. <laughs> uh, so uh, using that, so um, in this case, uh, Costan's TDS, uh, it's uh, generated by x plus x minus and then h. And then here, uh, SLN case, uh, it's easy to write down, x minus is, so let me just uh, use the representation. This appears in Costan's paper, so I just uh, copied down from uh, there, so n minus 1. Yeah, I do have to stop probably uh, negative two minutes uh, later or something, right? So, and then uh, Ri is I times N minus I. So this is X uh, uh, plus, and then uh, uh, it happens to be that uh, um, SLN case, it, everything is easy. So um, X plus is just uh, X minus transpose. H is uh, uh, X plus X minus which is just a, a diagonal matrix of R1 
r uh, 2 minus r1, r3 minus r2, up to minus rn minus 1. So it's diagonal. And then uh, uh, Hitchin section means that the E0 is uh, half canonical. So I have to choose a, a spin structure or a theta characteristic, whatever. So this line bundle um, powered with diagonal matrix, which means that uh, just a KC R1 over 2 plus and so on, all these diagonal entries, KC minus Rn minus 1 over 2. So this is the uh, vector bundle. And then uh, phi, uh, let me just write the phi of Q to be just uh, X minus plus, uh, let me just uh, cheat here uh, because of the sake of the time. So 2 to N and then qj x uh, plus to the power j minus 1. The reason is because I do have to introduce uh, positive roots, positive simple roots, to make this uh, um, expression going through arbitrary uh, Lie group g, but I don't do that. So here, SLN case, this works. And then a q is a q2 and so on, qn, which is just a, an element of uh, J runs from 2 to N, H0 of C, K, C, tensor J. So this is uh, uh, denoted by, so I want to denote by B, uh, Philip Bolt uh, wrote it uh, H, which is a Hitchin base. So indeed, from Hitchin base, I am uh, uh, giving you a unique Hitchin uh, Higgs bundle, E0, and then phi Q. Now, E0 is very far from stable vector bundle. But uh, this pair is stable. So it corresponds to the, um, uh, it, it is a point on the moduli space, stable uh, moduli space. And then uh, for this one, uh, you compute this procedure defining d of zeta r and then uh, changing the equation, Hitchin equation with r squared here. So, and then um, solve it. So then uh, that uh, uh, two parameter family is flat again, and then uh, you do. Uh, have a limit. So a uh, theorem is that, uh, yeah, a lot of people here. So theorem, uh, Olivier Dumitrescu, um, Laura Fredrickson, uh, uh, Georgios Kidonakis, and then uh, Raf Matteo, and then myself, and then Naitsky, and then with myself. So we show that uh, the conjecture is true. So what is happening? So the, the, the question is, how do you um, find a limit? So uh, quickly, how you uh, proceed of this kind of limit? First, you just uh, choose q equal to 0. And then uh, e0, and then um, just x minus. This is exactly what Hitchin considered in his 87 paper. So this one is also stable Higgs pair. And then uh, you plug into the hit, uh, Hitchin equation. So this actually gives you harmonicity condition for the fiber metric H. But uh, please look, E0 is a direct sum of uh, canonical to the powers. So canonical has a canonical metric if you fix the uh, Riemann um, um, surface structure. So Riemannian metric G on the surface, namely conformal class, I just uh, write it as a lambda squared dz dz bar, and then using this lambda. So lambda is a metric of kc minus half. So lambda to the power appears, and the fiber metric becomes uh, just a diagonal. And then uh, you plug it into this uh, Hitchin equation, and then uh, no q's are involved there. So you realize that uh, uh, the solution is a uh, um, constant curvature metric. So this uh, conformal class I chose has to be fixed as a um, constant curvature metric. Therefore, curve C is realized as a quotient of the upper half plane by the pi 1 of C. And then that also allows us to introduce um, unique um, projective structure. Projective structure on C uh, com comes from the solution of the Hitchin equation. Then what happens is that uh, around that uh, metric, 
And then uh, that was obtained by assuming Q equal to zero. Now Q is not equal to zero. You just uh, uh, use the uh, uh, Banachan analysis to solve this equation. But then the uh, limit uh, is very easy. So the formula, another formula I want to say is that zeta goes to zero, r goes to zero, and then r over zeta is equal to h bar fixed of d mm, uh, zeta r is actually is a two pieces. E h bar is a deformation of E zero as a vector bundle. And then a uh, nabla q of, uh, sorry, h bar, where E h bar is a, a unique um, filtered extension parameterized by h bar. Now the definition of h bar here <laughs> is so h1 of ckc. So h bar is an element of this. So uh, n equal to two case filtered extension is easy. I'm talking about, sorry, uh, in a minute. So kc, so I'm talking about the unique extension h bar. I'm talking about this one. So any element here would give, so this is a, a isomorphic to extension group. So this gives you the unique extension and I'm using that. So for higher rank case or general uh, uh, regroup case, you do have to work a little bit, but it's a filtered extension idea gives you <coughs> such a, a unique extension. And then the nabla h bar q is as simple as it could be. So in this vector bundle, which is no longer the same as before, but I'm using this uh, um, projective structure, you just uh, write down the exterior differentiation minus one over h bar, and then uh, uh, phi of q. Phi of q is that expression. That expression itself becomes a connection form in this new vector bundle. So this is the uh, limit open. Then the final thing I want to say is that, uh, um, so this one uh, is uh, my joint work with uh, Olivia Dumitrescu. This correspondence from uh, phi to this uh, final uh, connection does not really depend on that uh, assumption that the Q is a holomorphic section. Here you can put any um, poles over there h bar equal to zero goes back to the original, right. And then uh, if h bar is not zero, immediately all the complex structures are the same. So h bar equal to one or zero is only the case. But of course you do have a um, um, family. And then as you can see, you, uh, this is the Duin's uh, lambda connection. If you multiply h bar uh, everywhere, this is the Duin's connection. So uh, since it's time, uh, just one uh, word. Uh, because of this uh, filtration, and then there exists a, a filtered uh, filtration, um, I mean uh, H bar parameterized filtration, uh, this uh, um, D module here is uh, uh, principally generated, and then uh, you have a single uh, di differential operator globally defined again with respect to this uh, projective structure. And then uh, you apply the original idea of uh, semi classical limit as we did for the uh, Hurwitz case. It gives you a global uh, spectral curve, which is indeed characteristic polynomial of this phi. So in that sense, uh, WKB works, a semi-classical limit works, and then uh, you do have a quantization here. So that is the story I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Question, remarks? Just a clarification, when you say some limit exists and is an opera in several places, does it mean that the filtration that in the definition of an opera is, is exist? I mean, is it uniquely defined or is it a part of, you have to consider? Part of the definition, part of the data. No, but when you say the limit exists, how? You construct a, uh, filtration, yes, satisfying all these conditions. Ah, but you don't claim that it is unique. It's unique, yeah, with respect to h bar. Yes, there's a unique uh, uh, construction, right. But it doesn't mean that another filtration cannot satisfy the same property. No, no. Oper, oper is a property, not a, not a structure. But if you have a, if you have a, a connection, then the fact that it's an oper is a property, not a structure. 
that the, there's a theorem that if such a thing exists, it is unique. Yeah, but the theorem, uh, a proof of the theorem does contain the actual construction of this filtration, satisfying all this, right? Sorry, just maybe a stupid question. So, uh, so you started with this discussion with Horvitz's case, uh -huh. and then you, you, you moved to this. So, uh, is, so the Horvitz discussion was it only for motivation, or is there some kind of formal relation between those? Yes, two? always that's a question. That's uh, the place we want to go. But at this moment, we don't have it. Because here, everything is algebraic, and there it was kind right. of essentially holomorphic. So somewhat it was right. essentially non-algebraic, right. right? So you do want to go, go to the analytic situation. The all not situations and the grom of written situations are all over there in the analytic case, not in this case. Right. Other question or remarks? Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Please.